Aloha, everybody, and thanks so much for tuning in. I am Joanne Lamolino. I am the Associate Principal Trumpet of the Hawaii Symphony Orchestra, and I'm going to be talking all about mouthpieces today. Boom. Mouthpiece. So, first things first, I'm going to talk about the different parts of the mouthpiece. So, as you can see, we have the rim, which is that. We have the cup, which is this part. And then we have this part right here, which is the shank. We also have, there is a hole that goes from the cup into the shank. That's referred to as the throat. And then we have another hole from the back end of the shank. That's called the backbore. So this is really the backbore. That's the throat, cup, rim. So before I get into demonstrating uh, different types of mouthpieces and sizes that you may or may not have heard of so far. I'm going to show you um, a little bit of some mouthpiece practice that a lot of brass players do to warm up. So if you've never done any mouthpiece buzzing before, basically the reason why you would want to do it is to get the lips and the air moving together and get everything in balance. Obviously, you have your embouchure, which is all these muscles around your lips in your face. Then, that's your embouchure. Now, the hole where the air comes out of, out of your lips, that's called the aperture. So, you want to make sure that the aperture is in a good position. Hence, why you might want to do some mouthpiece buzzing. Um... When things are out of balance on the mouthpiece, you get stuff that's like this. That's a lot of tension. That's, you want to try to lighten up a little bit on there because it's out of balance. And then if you do too little air blowing and not enough tension, you get something like this. So, obviously, you want to be buzzing in a very healthy way. So, just a good balance. For me, I alternate between doing some scales and arpeggios on the mouthpiece, or sometimes I even buzz a song, um, just to get a good vocal style going. I know Rudy Hain, the bass trombone player in the Hawaii Symphony, he is fairly notorious in the back stage area for playing <clears throat> Amazing Grace on his mouthpiece. So, you can buzz songs or you can buzz scales, whatever you thought, whatever you like. I like to alternate. I don't like to get stuck in one routine or another. Um, it's very good to actually buzz your mouthpiece with some sort of keyboard instrument. It just kind of helps your ear kind of keep things um, honest. So I'm just going to buzz a little bit of a C major scale. It's a nice little way to kind of make stuff go. little thing you know I did it in C major then you may go into D major E major F major that type of thing I try to buzz my whole range every day in my mouthpiece routine um, it makes me feel pretty warmed up before I even get to warm up on the horn but that's just what I like a um, lot of people have different feelings as to how much mouthpiece buzzing they'd like to do um, some people like maybe a couple of minutes, some people like 10 minutes. I have another friend that, uh, he, he might actually buzz like a half an hour a day. Um, that doesn't totally work for me. So you want to just, maybe if you're new at mouthpiece buzzing, you might want to limit it to just a couple of minutes. It really will help focus your tone and get your air going in a nice balanced way. Okay. Now I'm going to start talking about some of these mouthpieces. Um, let's see, for those of you that didn't, that turned, 
Okay, we're reconnecting. All right, so as you can see, I got a lot of mouthpieces here. Uh-oh, sorry. There we go. And they're going to get, some of them are going to get played so that you can hear the different sound qualities on all of them. Okay, so the first one I'm going to start with is the most popular mouthpiece that trumpet players tend to start with when you're in, you know, elementary school or middle school. That is the Box 7C. <clears throat> Mine's a raw brass. Um, it's kind of old. It's actually a Bach Mount Vernon 7C. But that's what we got. So at any rate, I'm going to play a little bit of a concert E flat major scale, the B flat trumpets F major scale, and then I'm going to play a little bit of The Last Rose of Summer from the Arben book. If you caught Zach Silberschlag's uh, class from last Thursday, um, he did The Art of Phrasing. So The Last Rose of Summer is actually also in The Art of Phrasing. So you can check that out also. So here's F major scale on the 7C mouthpiece. <sighs> Now, I'm going to play a little bit of The Last Rose of Summer. So that's your 7C mouthpiece. Up next, a lot of kids tend to then switch to the Bach 5C mouthpiece. Uh, basically, what is different about it, oh, let me tell you about Bach numbering systems. So, Vincent Bach Company um, numbers their mouthpieces in a way that 7C and then the lower the number goes, it's actually the bigger that the rim is. So the number refers to the rim and the letter, like C for 7C or 5C, refers to the cup size. Um, the 7C actually has a fairly good bite on the rim, as we would say, so that it's very comfortable for a beginner to kind of get a good grip. And then you switch to a 5C, and it's a little less grippy, and the rim is slightly wider for when your muscles have developed after a year or two. I think maybe nowadays a lot of people might go from a 7C straight to a 3C, which will be the next mouthpiece I demonstrate. I went from a 7C to a 5C. There's also a lot of soloist type players that also play a 5C because it's a really comfortable, versatile mouthpiece and it helps you get all over the horn with a greater ease. <sighs> can hear it's maybe just slightly fuller because I can get a little bit more of my lip into the mouthpiece and that's the 5C. Now the 3C I'm going to demonstrate this is a very popular mouthpiece probably for kids that are in later middle school and high school age. Um, then that being said a lot of professionals play the 3C. It's a really fantastic well-rounded mouthpiece. I even use the 3C for pop shows like when we play Harry Potter at work or do uh, Star Wars or even um, for the Music That Rock series, a lot of times I'm playing my, my Bach 3C. It just gives it a slightly more brilliance in the sound than what I would ordinarily play for the Masterworks programs. So I'm going to play the exact same thing again. <sighs> And 
a very comfortable mouthpiece. It's really great, very versatile. Now, I'm going to play the exact same thing on my mouthpiece, which is a Bach one and a quarter C. So I've been playing this mouthpiece more or less, I would say, for the last, I don't know, maybe since I uh, graduated from graduate school, from the Manhattan School of Music. It's a very popular size. Once uh, you go to music school, it's very common that you would then play either a one and a half C, a one and a quarter C, a one C, or a one X. Those are, like I said, they're very, very popular mouthpieces. So I like the one and a quarter C. It works very well for my face. I'm going to play the exact same thing so that you can just hear the sound quality. <sighs> a very rich sound and it's really great for when you're playing in a large concert hall um, you can really play into the mouthpiece and you can get a lot of overtones that really ring in our hall so it's pretty awesome now the million dollar question that lots of people want to know is uh, is all about lead trumpet player mouthpieces so occasionally I do have a need to play something that's more for a lead player um, and I'm going to demonstrate a few different sizes of that right now. So I'm going to start with the Bach 3C, followed by the Bach 7E, and then I have a hand-me-down from former Honolulu Symphony principal trumpet, Don Hazard. This is one of his mouthpieces, and it's made by Marcinkowitz. So just to play a little bit in the style to hear how the mouthpiece sort of lights up, I'm just going to play a little bit of an F major scale with a little bit of a lip trill on it. What does lead player mean? Is that something needed for certain rep? Yes, it is. Um, so sometimes um, we lead playing would be um, if you've ever played in a big band setting, um, there is a trumpet player, the trumpet player that plays first trumpet, let's say in a big band, um, or you know maybe a high school jazz band, that type of thing, that person that plays first is the lead player. They are responsible for playing the high notes and kind of leading the charge with the band. Um, I know a few years ago, we legit needed a lead trumpet player to play on a program with Hawaii Symphony. And DeShannon Higa, he uh, joined us. He plays in the Royal Hawaiian Band. He's a fantastic jazz trumpet player and lead player. And it was for a Matt Kattengub Latin Nights. I remember he played this super cool solo on Cherry Pink and Apple Blossom White. It was awesome. But yes, that's what you would need a lead mouthpiece for. In fact, before I play these, I'm going to show you. The 7E is a little hard to see, but here would be the 3C cup. So, doesn't look very doesn't look very shallow. It's a pretty middle of the road cup. Now, here is a copy of one of Don Hazard's lead mouthpieces. So, as you can see, it's a lot shallower. My finger can barely go in there. In the 3C, I can do, I can get my finger in a little bit more. So now I'm going to show you what they sound like. Okay, so here's the 3C. So that would be that on a 3C. Not necessarily totally advisable to be doing that on a 3C, but now here's a 7E. Now, I've only talked about mouthpieces that have C cups thus far, C being the one that's kind of in the middle. When Bach did its numbering system many, many years ago, the B cup is actually a bigger cup 
the A cup is an even bigger cup. So when you go to, let's say, from a C and you go to a D cup, it's actually a little bit shallower and an E cup is even more shallow. Uh, the first mouthpiece that I ended up using on my piccolo trumpet was actually a 7E. That's a very popular size for that. This 7E is actually my friend's lead mouthpiece that he loaned to me. Now the reason why it's black is it's actually a tarnish. It really is silver, but I'm not going to polish it. I have to give it back though. So now I'm going to play the exact same thing that I did to the 3C. <clears throat> So that would be the 7E. Now, I'm gonna play the Don Hazard mouthpiece. And as you saw, it was very shallow. I'm not used to playing a mouthpiece that's this shallow, so fingers crossed. When you're not used to something that's so shallow, it's like a little wacky because you're not used to the balance in it. But it's a fun thing to have. And Don doesn't want it back, so I just have it. Okay, now, um, a mouthpiece I'm gonna show you is the cornet mouthpiece. The cornet mouthpiece in comparison to my mouthpiece, which is, I don't know where right now, it's like vanished. All right, I'll just pick a mouthpiece, any mouthpiece. All right, so as you can see, here's a trumpet mouthpiece. Now here's a cornet mouthpiece. It's much shorter because it doesn't go in as far. What's the technique difference of an orchestral player and a lead player from a jazz band setting? It, okay, the easiest way I can describe it is, um, it's how we use our air that's kind of different. We both use a large amount of air. Don does have a lot of mouthpieces. Yeah, it's insane for sure, E Tromba. I've seen the collection and I've seen all the trumpets. It's nuts. All right, so getting back to this. So a lead trumpet player, the way that they use their air is slightly different than how a classical player will use our air. Um, a classical player, the way that I can sort of describe it, I guess, is um, a classical player, it's sort of like if you're on a sailboat and you have to get the perfect balance between the, uh, between the wind and how much you're pulling on the rope for the sail. That's kind of classical playing. And when you've caught enough wind and you're going, it's beautiful, it's smooth. That's the deal with that. When you're playing lead trumpet, your air has to move very fast, um, sort of like as if you're riding a jet ski. So it's more, you're, you're making more compression in your body by probably lifting a little more from the diaphragm and also using more of arching, in, arching of your tongue. It's described to me more or less uh, a really good friend of mine who is a lead trumpet player in New York City. He would say that you're, you end up getting the airstream to move faster almost by arching your tongue and moving forward with it. So it's like something like that. Some people may argue with what I just did, but that's how he described it to me. I don't play a lot of lead trumpet per se, so, but I can tell you this, that I can speed up the air and you guys can try it at home right now. It's sort of like when a cat like hisses at you, that sensation for me, the tongue is a little too far back in the mouth and I think it would actually stop the air. So I think the whole case with using your tongue to speed up the air is the tongue has to be far forward to do that so that the air does not get trapped in your throat and you have a really clear way, it has a really clear path to get out. So getting back to trumpet cornet mouthpieces, I just want you to hear, as you can see, so here's a C cup, one and a quarter C mouthpiece. And that's the cup, very, very standard, right 
down, you know, right in the middle. Now here's the coronet mouthpiece cup. It is very, very deep. My finger can go in very far there. And I just want you to hear the difference of them. As you can hear, the depth of the cup has made it a much darker, lower sort of sound. And when you hear a cornet, a lot of times it needs to sound that way, or most of the times it does. It's a, it's a bit of a, a darker sort of sound than the trumpet. Okay, now I'm going to show you, ah, piccolo trumpet mouthpieces. So here's my piccolo trumpet. The mouthpiece I like to use for piccolo is actually a Warburton and it is a it is a shallower cup than say my C cup as you can see a little bit more shallow and my rim is a little bit narrower I don't play with the same width rim I like the sensation of it being a little narrower so I'm just gonna play the opening of uh, the Prince of Denmark March on my piccolo trumpet with my piccolo mouthpiece. Then I'm going to play the exact same thing on my regular mouthpiece that I use to play B flat and C trumpet, just so that you can hear the difference of why it's important to have a really good balanced mouthpiece with your piccolo trumpet. play the same thing on normal mouthpiece for me. So it kind of works. For me, the balance isn't quite right. I like a little bit more of the shallow cup and the narrower rim and it really makes the piccolo trumpet sparkle versus a bigger mouthpiece for the piccolo. Okay, now this is going to be very exciting. So orchestral players, when we are, when we pick out mouthpieces to play on our C or B flat trumpets or our E flat and D trumpets, what orchestral rep requires you to use a piccolo trumpet? The uh, pictures at an exhibition, Goldenberg and Schmiel movement, that has it. Actually, in a couple of weeks, when I do a class on mutes, I'm going to talk all about that. Um, Bolero, there is, a, there is a nice piccolo trumpet part towards the end. Um, what else? Rite of Spring also has a piccolo trumpet part. Um, where else can you use it? Then, I mean, those are the three big ones. So, for big orchestra using piccolo trumpet. So, for a mouthpiece, what orchestral rep... Oh, yeah, same question. All right, thanks, Chris. So now, um, I mentioned before the different parts. So we have the rim, the <clears> cup. <throat> we have the throat, which is this hole from the cup into the shank, which is this whole piece. And then we have the back bore, which is this hole going this way. Yes, Norm, we definitely do it on Bach as well. And handle uh, the Baroque works, basically. But we don't play a lot of Bach in the orchestra, at least in full orchestra. So that's why I didn't mention it. So at any rate, uh, what a lot of orchestral players end up doing is we end up drilling out the hole for the throat and drilling out the back bore. The back bore can be a lot of different shapes. And then um, and the throat size, the standard throat size on any Bach mouthpiece or any Yamaha mouthpiece that you buy is what they call a 27 throat. So a lot of people will end up drilling the throat out because eventually it's kind of, it backs up a little bit on you because you end up using a lot more air than it can support. So many orchestral players play a 24 throat with a 24 backbore. 24 has to do with the bit size that they use to drill. And I believe that the 24 size is also was also a measurement of the tool that was originally used. So there are different 
many, many different backboards. It's kind of crazy. But the most standard for, I would say, an orchestral player is more or less some sort of combination of 24 throat, 24 backboard. There's also very common for a 22 throat, which is a bigger throat, and the 24 backboard. And then there's plenty of variations from there. So what I'm going to show you now is four different one and a quarter mouthpieces that have different cups and different throat and backboard combinations. What are some indicators that a student, especially young students, need a different mouthpiece? That's a good question. If the student, if you start to think that the student, let's say, is playing a 7C, and maybe the sound starts to sound a little pinched or they start to say they feel like the mouthpiece is backing up on them, then you might want to consider having them try something a little bigger, like a 5C or a 3C. Um, that's usually the indicator that I see in my own private students. My husband, who's a high school band director, is sitting in the room with me, and he just said that when a freshman comes in and they can play and they sound very strong, he just gives them a 3C. Well, a, f a, five, a 5. Oh, a 5. A 5. I usually start What if they're already playing a 5? Then I'll move them to 3. Then a 3. Yeah, I, I follow the progression. He follows the progression. Um, yeah, I mean, with my own students, I'm not a big stickler for you got to be playing this mouthpiece and doing that. There are some <laughs> teachers that are very much into that. Um, I think whatever works and the student is playing uh, comfortably with a really great sound, then they stay on that mouthpiece unless they want something different. And sometimes that happens, like peer pressure or, or things like that. And then that could be good or bad, depending on the situation. But right now, I'm going to play, I'm going to tell you what the different combinations are on these four, and then I'm going to play... So I'll play the opening of pictures at an exhibition so that you can hear the difference. I'm also picking up my C trumpet for that. So this is my mouthpiece. This has the one and a quarter rim with a C cup, 24 throat, and it's not quite a 24 backbore. It is a backbore that's labeled M24, and it's made by a company, uh, the Park Company. Uh, so de basically, the M24 is a slightly different shape than the 24. I think it might be smaller. I'm not totally sure. But I get a very good balance on this mouthpiece. So this is mine. Now I'm going to play a one and a quarter with a CB cup with a 24 throat and a 24 backboard. So the CB cup is a cup that a mouthpiece maker in Japan makes. His name is Toshi. He makes very, very nice mouthpieces. I only recently got this mouthpiece and I'm kind of into it. So it's a little fuller. It can take a little bit more air because it has. There's a little bit more, a uh, little bit more that the cup can take. It's very nice. Now I'm gonna play a one and a quarter rim with a 24 throat, 24 backbore, and a 5B underpart. The 5B underpart was extremely popular in New York. I would say probably in the 80s, 90s, 2000s. Um, basically, you know, uh, the New York Philharmonic trumpet players played this mal uh, played some assemblance of this mouthpiece, um, the 5B underpart that was found that they would put on like a 1C rim. Very, very cool. So if you ever heard the name Phil Smith or... Hey, how's it going? So if you ever, um, yeah, heard of the name Phil Smith, who was fantastic principal trumpet player of the New York Philharmonic for many, many years, or Vince Penzarella, they both played that 5B underpart with their, you know, 1C rooms. <clears throat> so now I'm going to play the same thing, opening up pictures. <sighs> It's a nice, rich tone. 
I really like it. It, you know, it's another mouthpiece that would sound really great in our hall because it can really carry. Now, the last one. Oh, the last one is a Vincent Bach mouthpiece from the Bach Company. These were hybrids of Bach and Toshi. Um, this is the Bach Symphonic Series. So this one is basically a one and a quarter C with a 25 throat and a 24 back bore. So the throat size is now just a little bit smaller. So it gives it maybe a little bit more of a shimmer for me, the way I'm playing this one. So, okay, oh, a couple other mouthpieces I wanted to show you. So, um, this right here, this broken looking mouthpiece is called a mouthpiece visualizer. So when I'm warming up and before I excuse me, do my mouthpiece routine on my regular mouthpiece, I do a little routine on the visualizer. The reason why I use it, um, it's sort of, there are some people that are very much into what we call free buzzing, where you would actually buzz, let me get a pitch. So they would actually buzz their range or some semblance of their range with the free buzz. I'm not a huge free buzz person. I didn't do it from a really young age, so I never really grew up with that culture. Um, I studied with a teacher that suggested I use the visualizer, so I'm more or less getting the same thing. It's just another... Another way to make sure that everything is kind of focused in and there's a good balance between the air and your lips. Now, we have a cheater mouthpiece for soft playing, and that's this one. This one is actually made by a company called Shilky, and it's the F1. Um, here, let me show you. That's a brilliant idea. Let me show you the cup. The cup is a lot deeper than my regular C cup here. It's a lot deeper and it's sort of like a cheater mouthpiece if we have to play something soft. So demonstrate that. I'm going to play the opening of Schumann's Second Symphony if I had to play it on a piston valve trumpet. It's back of the hall soft. It's not very soft. Now, I'm going to play it on this. I'm using the same effort, and it just eats up so much of my sound. So when a conductor says, trumpets, can that be a little softer? and really I'm not that comfortable, I may use that. So would a lot of trumpet players, actually. Everyone's sort of got a little soft cheater in their bag because you kind of need the tools. What about the mouthpiece makes it easier to play soft? Oh, the depth of the cup is what makes it easier because it's very deep as if maybe like it was sort of like a flugelhorn cup. Unfortunately, my flugelhorn mouthpiece is sitting in Honolulu right now, and I'm not, so I can't show that. But as you can see, I think you can see the difference on there. Tell me if it's not that clear. But basically, yeah, it's just much deeper, and it just kind of eats up the sound. That's what deeper cups do also. Um, at least something, the way it's shaped, it's shaped a little more like a V. So that's how it eats up the sound rather than something that's more like a bowl, um, which is, you know, what we would more or less play all the time. All right. So I think I talked about a lot of mouthpieces. Um, 
do you guys have any questions out there in Instagram land? I guess not. I guess I was pretty clear. If anyone has any questions moving forward, please feel free, you know, to message us over at HSO Musicians. We're always happy to answer some questions and, you know, connect with the audience because this is how we're connecting these days. And we're super, super thankful to have it. It's awesome for where we are. Um, do you use Thompson's exercises? Yes, I do. I actually don't use them all the time, but I was on a major tear of that book shortly after it came out, Buzzing. What is being referred to in the question is Jim Thompson's Buzzing Basics was what it was first called. And then when the book came out again, it was called um, The Buzzing Book. Yes, I love The Buzzing Book. I think it's really fantastic. The reason why I think it's fantastic, for those of you that maybe aren't familiar with it is um it has a play along recording and basically uh and a rhythm regular versus megatone i'll answer that in a second um so buzzing basics is basically taking your basic things um you know sort of arpeggios and playing along with um you know chords in the background and a rhythm in a rhythm which so you're getting you're playing in time you're playing in tune and you're really having to hear that's one of the great things about buzzing practice in general it really works on your ear training because you don't have that to depend on to get pitches to come out you just have to you have to hear it and that's you know a huge part of playing a brass instrument is you know developing that really great ear so that you can just play <laughs> you can just play without missing and you play right in the center you it's all about how you hear um regular verse megatone um a lot of people like megatone mouthpieces um i was never really into it just because of the added weight on the mouthpiece um there's a company called monet and they make mouthpieces that also have added weight on it also have added weight and they are um i think it depends on the sound that you hear in your head that you feel like you're the creator of so if you feel like the megatone speaks more to what's in your heart as far as how you want to sound then i think the megatone is great um for me i'm more of a i'm more of a I don't even want to. Uh, what I was uh, what I was thinking sounds very dirty. I'm more of a C cup sort of person, so I like the way that sounds. Um, for me, that's how I hear my trumpet playing. Oh, thanks so much. Thanks so much, Ray. Thanks for tuning in. That was super cool. Um, are there any other mouthpiece trumpet related questions? I am currently playing on a 3C mouthpiece. What mouthpiece would you recommend as an upgrade mouthpiece? I play in high school band. Well, 3C, like I said, I think is a fantastic all-around mouthpiece. But you may want to check out looking into a Bach 1.5C. That's a really... Uh, when I switched from a 3C, I went to a 1.5C, and I felt like it was a very, very comfortable mouthpiece to go to. Um, you may also want to order a Bach one and a quarter mouthpiece. Um, the rim shape is a little different. It might feel a bigger. I'm not sure if dimensionally it actually is bigger. I think it might just be the shape of the inner bite on the rim. Um, but yeah, I would totally check out Bach one and a half C or Bach one and a quarter C. I mean, if worse comes to worse, you're holding on to, you know, I would maybe order both of them and see what you sound best on. Um, the way that I like to test out mouthpieces, I actually just like to play a scale and I put a recorder on, on the other side of the room from where I am. And I'll just listen back. I wanna hear where the center of the pitch is on the mouthpiece. I also want to hear how clear the fronts of the notes are. So if I'm if I'm testing a mouthpiece, this is a very common thing that I would play. <sighs> So 
I try to play a healthy forte on that. Then I also try to play it soft, like a mezzo piano, comfortable mezzo piano, to see how it rings. So let's say I'm trying out that mouthpiece, which is the CB cup. And now let's say I'm going to do the same on the 5B cup. kind of covering all your bases like can you just play a very simple scale in tune and right in the center and your fronts are exactly what you want and then you would listen back to that recording because the another big trick when you're playing or you're testing something is you can't be a performer and a critic at the same time so if you're sitting behind the bell you need to be focused on making the music not necessarily critiquing exactly what's happening. That's why you have the recorder on the other side of the bill so that your focus can be in one spot and not necessarily in both. So I hope that was a help. That 5B cup has a nice density color to it. Thanks, it does, it's really nice. Um, I'm not sure I want it to be my everyday sort of cup and it's hard it's hard because we're not in the hall right now where I can you know play test a lot of these things you know I'm in my house and I don't have I don't have a large space to test them out so whatever I'm playing right now whenever we get back in our hall I'm gonna have to check out again hey Daniel awesome but thank you that's very cool Eric thank you um, any other questions before I wrap it up? All right. Well, thanks again, everyone, for uh, tuning in. This was super fun for me. And if you have any questions, please, uh, you know, you can message them over to HSO Musicians. And, uh, you know, someone will be very, very happy to get back to you. So have a good afternoon. Play a high G, like a double high G. <laughs> well... I don't know. We'll see. A G? There you go. That's your G. If you want another G? There's another G for you. <laughs> Very cool. Okay. Have a good rest of your afternoon or a good evening wherever you're uh, watching from. And thanks again. Aloha.